Welcome to Women in the Middle Entrepreneurs, the podcast that gives you an unfiltered behind the scenes look at what it's really like being a woman in the middle who's over 50 and following her entrepreneurial dreams. Grab a superhero cape girlfriend because you deserve one. I'm your host, Master Certified Life Coach and Midlife Mentor, Susie Rosenstein, and I am excited to inspire you with interviews that feature all of this midlife amazingness. Let's go. Hey there, welcome back to the show. We have a really exciting interview ahead of us about how my guest helps menopausal women get their sleep back. Today, you're going to be meeting Kathy Rust, a woman in the middle entrepreneur who founded a sleepwear company dedicated to helping women who suffer from night sweats start sleeping again. How amazing is this? Welcome to the show, Kathy. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Susie. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Oh, me too. I know we're going to have a great conversation about your midlife entrepreneur story. We're going to be talking about your business and what's going really well, and also what midlife issues might be getting in your way to some extent and are challenging for you in life, as well as being a business owner. So let's kick this off with you talking a little bit about how old you are, how long you've been an entrepreneur, and what your entrepreneurial story is. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I am uh, 60 years old. I just passed that big milestone in February. Woohoo! Uh, happy birthday. <laughs> Gee, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> one, one day I'm going to write a book called Ronald Reagan, Bob Marley, and Me. We were all born on February the 6th. Well, there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I started my entrepreneurial journey when I was pretty much out of grad school. I've only ever worked for small businesses. I I like the idea of a variety. I like doing different things all the time, team spirit, help out wherever you can. And as soon as I get pigeonholed into one job, I find I get bored because it becomes predictable. So I leave. And uh, that's really how I got started. I love startups. Not all of them are successful. We have made it through, but some of them have been very successful. And uh, startups also tend to offer me a little bit more flexibility, uh, being at home mostly with three kids when they were younger. And then I started back more um, traditionally, um, I guess, in about 2005 as a part-time writer at homestars.ca. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So what happened that you went from that sort of a thing to this amazing business to help sweaty women? I'll try to put this in a nutshell. So the long and short of it is we moved to Montreal in 2011 for my husband's work. I had a lot of difficulty finding a job here because my French is okay, but it's not at a level that it needs to be to be in an office setting. Oh, that's interesting because, you know, we have a lot of American listeners and it is really interesting part of Canada that is French speaking. Yes, yes. Far more French speaking than when I had remembered um, because I did go to McGill and in the 30 years um, that we had been away when we came back, it had rightly so become very, very uh, more French forward, shall we say? I'm not really sure. But my French, although it's decent, especially after a glass of wine, um, <laughs> it's not the, really the way you want to go into business. So, so I did. I did do some some work here. I worked in an environmental insurance company, helping them set up an environmental insurance program. In 2015, 2016, I did some other work and I ended and landed in 2016 at a management consulting firm where I helped them with their back end um, communications because I knew a lot about WordPress and how to shape newsletters. I have a background, an educational background in environmental policy. So doing other newsletters isn't really my number one goal. And uh, and so I did it to to help out and because I wanted to keep busy and all that sort of stuff. But that company was sold in January of 2020. And Ooh. yeah, so it was merged and I was out of a job and it was uh, I was quite pleased to be out of a job in that in that point at that point. And it offered me the opportunity to figure out what the heck I wanted to do with the rest of my life. My kids were, my daughter was our youngest and she was in um, second or second year at Queens. 
And I, I had this open slate, this blank slate. What am I going to do? The world is my oyster. Or, or do I want to pack it all in and say, enough is enough. I'm playing tennis and bridge for forever. Like th- those were kind of like my two extremes. It's like uh, a midlife wake up call where all yeah. of a sudden yeah. you have a blank slate, which is a gift and, and an opportunity. Right. Right. It, it, and it's not a curse. It's just that when you have a buffet open to you, what do you do? What do you, your stomach is only so big. It's like your capacity is only so large to take something on. And I really didn't know. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, in the meantime, we were moving. And in theory, we were moving back to Toronto from Montreal. But the pandemic changed all of that. Um, and so while I'd been focused on getting the house all packed up and, um, getting everything ready to go, the pandemic hit and we said, you know what? Let's not do anything at the moment. Let's just stay in Montreal, you know, figure out what the heck is happening in the world. And so we, we rented a place here and then we were all literally sort of boxed in for a little while, right? With the pandemic. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I, I know it was so scary and so crazy and real estate prices were crazy. Yeah. And that was uh, probably a very good idea. Well, we ended up moving on March the 15th <laughs> and, and then the hammer came down on March the 17th. We weren't even sure our movers were going to show up that day. Oh my God. So, so we finally, we get in, we get all settled and then the dust settles. We're all in our little jail cells and we're thinking three weeks, we just have to last for three weeks. What can I, <laughs> don't you Were all of you there, days? the five of you? So we had two here and our place that we, that we got was not big enough for five. We're supposed to be empty nest. Oh my goodness. So many of us ended up with a full nest during that period. I kept thinking, thank God we're not around in 1918 when there was no internet and a pandemic, you know? Oh, was yeah. that what it was? 1918, I think. I think that was. I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, go ahead. So here you were in a in an apartment, literally so, boxed in without enough bedrooms. Right. Without enough <laughs> bedrooms with a fridge that is too small for two large boys and a, a girl and our daughter and ourselves. It, it was it was something else. It was just, uh, you know, scary days in those days. But once the dust settled, then the question is what do I do? And now my world had gotten a little bit smaller because I thought, well, okay, maybe I can do something online. And, and so at that point, I, I was looking for a business. Of course, a YouTube thing comes up and it's a course on, it sounds so silly, how to sell on Amazon. And I thought it looked really interesting. I just thought, wow, I've never sold any goods. And there was, there's always been an underlying part of me that has been sitting on the sidelines watching all of these other brave entrepreneurs move forward, take those, those steps. I've worked with them, beside them, and supported them, but I was never ready to be the lead, to be the Ooh. one who wanted to take that first step and say, okay, now it's my turn. Nice. And this kind of offered me that opportunity to learn how to sell goods on Amazon. And I thought, well, this could be interesting. So I signed up for the course, talked to my husband. I said, what do you think? Like, do you think this is going to be a good thing? And meanwhile, he's just reeling from the work. Like he's had to go from the office into our, we found, we found him a place in the house, in our new place to, to do the Zoom calls. And trust me, we all have to be quiet because there's no real place for him to close the door in the setup oh. that, that we got. So um, he said, sounds good go for it, that sort of thing. So I, I took the course and while I'm taking the course and I'm meeting all these great people online and we had this big Canadian support group where we're all learning at the same time, the gloss, oh yeah, it's so easy, sell your own product versus the reality of setting up a business are night and day. It was, it was such an eye-opener and such a shocker for me in terms of uh, maybe I was naive because I wanted to be naive and because I wanted to go down that path. But they really, all of these fancy videos um, that are on YouTube really gloss over, oh, it's easy. You just set up your own 
corporation and you do all of this and this and blah, 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 that sort of stuff. And you, you order stuff online and you tweak it so that yours is slightly different than anybody else's. So I took this course and then, and I loved, I love school. I love, I love learning. So, uh, so I loved that aspect of it, but I have an environmental policy background. And so what that means is I didn't want to, to sell anything that I believed was a fad, a phase, or just not going to be useful in the long term. I just, I couldn't bring another little thing, gadget, trinket into the world because we have enough. We have enough plastic in our landfills. We have enough of everything. What I really wanted was something that was useful and that that people found useful, solved a problem, that sort of thing, and and a real problem. So while all of that is going on and I'm looking for a product and I'm looking at how I'm going to sell it because I've decided, well, this is good. I can hide behind the internet. I don't have to talk to people. Uh, <laughs> and it and Amazon takes care of everything for me, which is not true, by the way, any way, shape or form. And in the end, I do not sell on Amazon because I have a lot of difficulty with the platform from a vendor perspective. So so that's a whole other conversation that's yeah. not yeah not worth it. So um what I ended up doing was at the same time I was suffering terribly from night sweats. Like night sweats like you would not believe. It would leave me deprived of any sort of energy or cognitive abilities the next day. Sheer exhaustion. Just awful. It was every 15 minutes all night long mm-hmm. flipping the covers off and on until wow. I was a walking zombie. And that had been going on for well over two years. So, wow. so it was, it was really, really horrific. So at, while I'm suffering, finally, after two years, I just kept thinking this will go away. My mother never complained about menopausal symptoms. Mine will end. Everything will be fine. So that was not, in fact, true. I was not fine. It was really awful. And this was actually three years after menopause that I started have these night sweats started a year after menopause and kept getting worse. Mm. The less estrogen I had, the worse the night sweats got. So anyway, so while I'm just feeling awful, I I am looking around for a solution. I go to I, I realize one morning, okay, I I need to get a cotton nightgown. This is ridiculous. I've been using an old secondhand nightgown that my mom didn't want anymore. So she said, do you want it? I said, sure, whatever. So I take it. And what it is, sleeping in polyester is basically wrapping yourself in saran wrap. It is a plastic-based product. It is wrapping you in saran wrap. No wonder your night sweats are worse because you're trapping all that heat and moisture next to your body. And it just... So it it didn't occur to you that your night clothing might be part of the solution? That is such a good question. And the only thing I kept thinking was... I wish I had something better than this. And yet I would never look for it. And then, oh, this is so related to the underwear thing. You know, if you're a listener of the Women in the Middle original podcast, you may remember that in episode six, it was one of the first topics I addressed was this underwear problem. And the way women our age allow ourselves to wear pathetic panties and not think anything of it, except I don't know where to shop. It's not worth it for me to purchase new ones. It feels too indulgent to spend that much money. I'll make sure my kids have great underwear, but I won't even worry about myself. And it's just something that doesn't get addressed. And here we go again with something that a very smart, intelligent woman like yourself, something that you're wearing one third of your life and you have a problem that's not, uh, you're not getting good sleep. That's so fascinating to me. But still you were willing to wear some hand-me-down thing um, and wrap. never give it a saran wrap, <laughs> hand me down saran wrap and never give it a second thought. Oh, we're fascinating, aren't we? Aren't we? Aren't we, Jess? So uh, so the other thing is that I, I haven't mentioned is that I also have a background in green building. And this is why I worked at Homestars. So I was supposed to work at Homestars to start their green building blog and talk about green building. And um, the woman who founded it, Nancy Peterson, She said, before you start that, could you please write a couple of articles on home renovation? And and so that was how I got started into blogging. And I blogged about home renovation and energy efficiency and all that sort of stuff. 
And there is a reason and they are linked, believe it or not. Oh, I totally see how this is linked. As soon as you said your environmental background, I'm like, oh, I get it now. I get it. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so I did, I worked at Homestars for four years, had just an absolute blast working there. And, um, and then I wanted to continue pursuing green building and talk about where do you buy green building materials? How do you renovate green building when, um, you live in Toronto? It was, uh, when you live in Toronto and where do you find them? Where do you find the right contractors? So I started a blog based on all of those things. And it's still on today. It's limping along because I haven't had the time to put into it. So, but there is a reason that I'm talking about this. I became really well-versed in green building materials, what works from a natural home perspective. And one of the fabrics that works or materials that works really well in green building on many different levels is hemp. So hemp can be turned into concrete. It can be turned into insulation. It can be turned into paper. It can be turned into a million different things. It can all, well, 250 to be exact. It can also be turned into fabric. And when hemp as concrete or as insulation is put into buildings, it actually can moderate heat and moisture inside of buildings. So in a room that has hemp pre-exposed or um, a way for moisture to get into the insulation, that insulation, so in other words, you can't paint it with acrylic paint or anything because that blocks it, but that insulation can moderate heat and moisture hmm. in the room. Heat and moisture. Heat and moisture. <laughs> Light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so, but my brain hadn't quite caught up to my knowledge at that point, right? Well, you so, know what? It's because it's creativity now. Like it's clear you love to learn. You're you've got all the trees, but the forest needs some creativity and a little bit of application. And and anybody who's listening right now can see how all the ducks are lining up. <laughs> That's, yeah. So go ahead. So so while all of this is going on, and I'm th- looking for a new business, and I'm thinking about what I want to do, and I'm dying because I'm so exhausted. And the cotton nightgown, which I thought cotton is breathable. Therefore, it is going to help me sleep better. I'm just going to go out and buy a 100% cotton nightgown. So I run down the street because we live close to a mall and it's got a couple of nightgown lingerie stores in it, a La Vion Rose. And so I go into La Vion Rose and they have $20 nightgowns, 100% cotton. Perfect. I'll take it. Take my cotton nightgown home, put it on that night, so happy. I'm going to sleep so much better. Wake up the next morning, soaked, totally soaked. And I thought, well, maybe I didn't wear it properly. I mean, these are the <laughs> things that you think, right? I must not know how to wear a nightgown properly. I just, I, the logic escapes me in terms of how I'm trying to justify, well, cotton, cotton is breathable. Therefore it works. Like this is what this, because my, my knowledge of fabric at that point was very, very, very small. Mm. And I didn't know whether or not that was the case. I mean, I just assumed it was. So I continued wearing it for a month. After a month, I look at it and it is stained everywhere with sweat. And it actually scared me to see how drenched and how stained it was. And I just thought, well, okay, so cotton isn't the right answer what is and that when i made that discovery that was the point where i said okay now i really have to do serious fabric research and in my head i was looking for a nightgown that was made from hemp because i'd just been to the green building conference in toronto and i talked to these two great farmers who are actually from asbestos quebec and they want to turn it into insulation based on hemp. And, and so the, the, it's, it's really fascinating. The irony is really interesting. These, t- these guys were fantastic. So unbelievable. Yeah. So they, they didn't, little did they know what was coming next. <laughs> exactly. So, so these guys are talking to me about hemp and the benefits of hemp insulation and all that sort of stuff. And I'm thinking in my head, well, 
you know, this, this uh, hemp would be really great as a fabric if it works that well. So I go online and I look up hemp based nightgown. And the only thing I can find anywhere is these cute little hemp bikinis made for um, the cannabis crowd who are in their 20s. And I'm looking at it going, yeah, that's not going to work. For one thing, it's not, it's not covering any of the parts where we do all of our sweating. And secondly, I'm a 50 plus year old woman and I'm not going to wear any of that. So that actually struck me as when I couldn't find anything and I started looking up cooling nightgowns and all that sort of stuff. And I saw that most of them are made out of fabric that I didn't think I could be wrong, of course. Um, it wasn't what I was looking for. That's the best way to put it. And, and then, of course, at this point, too, you're not thinking about a business. You just want to help yourself. I just want to help myself. Yeah. I just want to solve this problem for me. The one thing I did have a realization about was I was shocked at how little was on the market for menopausal women. Shocked. Mm. I couldn't. I actually took it as a personal insult. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why. You know, as you're as you're explaining the problem, I'm so with you in your mind and how it's working. What about sheets? So, Are you finding the same issue with sheets? So I went down the sheets road. So when I finally realized that I could help women get their sleep back by providing them with a better moisture wicking, heat managing fabric, the very first place I went to was sheets. It's like, I want to make sheets for people who are hot and sweaty. And it's just the cash outlay and the risk involved for doing sheets right off the bat was just more than I could really manage at the time. I just, you know, it's it, it's what I have to do and where the real challenge for my business is, is changing a mindset. And changing that mindset is a very long journey. And now when you say changing women. a mindset, is it what part of the mindset is that there is a way, there's something environmental that can help them? Or what's yes, the block? So th there are a couple of blocks. One is the, the price point for mine is steeper than all of the other products that are out there. And that is because the fabric is not well known. It is difficult to get. And I make them in Montreal. So oh, wait, um, we, sk we skipped a step. So the hemp farmers, these guys, they're yeah. talking and you, it sounds like you had some amazing conversations. I did. The light bulb started to go crazy. You're realizing yep. there's a hole in the market. Yeah. And now you're all fired up because yep. no pun intended, because people are ignoring menopausal women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And so, so that, that actually, that bit happened in December of 2019, right before the pandemic. Oh came my God. Yeah. Right before. And it right before and and so while all of this is happening because as uh, because my job with the management consulting firm was only part time i also had this blog that i loved to write on green building so i was keeping that up as well which meant that i would go to the canadian construction show and i would go and talk to all these farmers and i was really in my element and i i loved all that stuff so so i've got all of that sort of building in my head like how can i take advantage of this great fabric and i'm dying here i've got to find something yeah. And, and so, but I'm still not at the connection of the two for as a business. It was right. once I got into providing, once I took that Amazon course and I realized I don't just want to provide something on Amazon. I want to provide something that's meaningful for as many people as possible to help them with a problem. And I want to provide them with something that's easy to use, easy to wear, long lasting. Like it, it had to really meet a lot of criteria from my perspective. Yeah. And, and so that was when I started thinking, being sheets, I'll do sheets. And then when you look at how expensive, so I started saying, well, what yeah. would I use? I would use hemp. And 100% hemp, what, what most people imagine is a burlap sack. That's what they will imagine when they think of hemp. And, and so because of that, I started looking for uh, blends hemp blends. So I found this company that is a manufacturer. They're based in the States and they make all kinds of fabulous hemp-based blends. And I called them up and I said, this is what I'm thinking. They sent me their package and um, of all of their different samples, but the price point per yard is just, it's, let me put it this way. It's in the future. 
definitely mm-hmm. sheets are in the future. It wasn't, it wasn't the right place to start. Sure. And because my own story was relatable to a lot of women in terms of just how bad my night sweats were. Well, and you have a hilarious story about the nightgown from your mom too. I mean, come on, that whole thing is pretty good. (laughs) It is, it is really sad that, you know, oh, I'll just wear this polyester saran wrap nightgown. Like, I don't care. And, uh, and then you realize, oh, well, that's one of the reasons why you're sweating so much. And it's also why women who end up just as a side note, where the nightgowns still might suffer and their nightgowns still might get wet is because they are sleeping in polyester sheets. So, so it's a double whammy. It's a double whammy. For many and, women. Yeah. So so when did you get the idea to, you ditched the sheet idea, but you're yeah. like, well, maybe it's nightgown. Yeah. So I did all the, I did the cost workup. I started contacting manufacturers, which during the pandemic is really difficult. And not only that, but manufacturers are not easily found online. A lot of the local mom and pop manufacturers don't, it's all word of mouth. So you have to know people. And fortunately, I have a good friend here who knows almost everyone there is to know in Montreal. And she set me up with a friend of hers who has a line of outerwear, ski clothes. And uh, she set me up with her manufacturer. So that was literally word of mouth how I found my manufacturer. Well, that's something. But also many listeners probably don't know that Montreal is known for fashion in Canada. It, You know, it is. But I have to say everyone I talk to here and that's exactly I thought I'm in the best city for fashion. Yeah. But here's the thing. A lot of it has either moved overseas or to Toronto. Oh, the local the local stuff. So I'm very lucky because the factory that I'm using here, they do all their own local sewing. And um, they also have, if I ever go the overseas route, they have a huge connection overseas as well. I, I just, labor is really important to me, right? So I have to make sure that my factories are well certified. That's why I like having them in Montreal. I go in, I take a look, I see where they all are, that kind of thing. So, you know, I want to take responsibility. I don't want to be the ones working with just... No, I hear you. And it's it's everything. It's your brand. Right. You know, it was your personal brand and now it's your business brand. And I have to say that I've been on your website and I can't wait to get a nightgown. So (laughs) tell me first, what's the name of the company? Oh, it's called CoolYourSweats.com. Coolyoursweats.com. Yeah, it's cool Cool your sweats. So good. Yeah. So tell me, one of the main things that we love on this podcast is to talk a little bit about the intersection between you running a business and you're clearly running a business and being a midlife woman who's dealing with midlife classic, classic types of issues. So when I asked you in your application about some of these issues, you mentioned things like not having the same energy level being more conservative in your willingness to invest in your family nest egg into the, uh, to invest the nest egg into the business because of your age. I was, I mean, you're the first person I've interviewed who'd really articulated that, which was great. You also talked about lack of enthusiasm for social media, which totally understand. Sometimes you get pangs of self-doubt because you're doing it on your own and your age and the classic worry that you have enough time left because you know, the finish line is in sight. So can you just pick one of those things and expand on a little bit? Because I thought you did such a good job of articulating them. Oh, thank you. I, you know, it's interesting because when you said that you were starting this podcast, because I do listen to Women in the Middle, I thought, oh my gosh, can I ever relate to starting a business in your 50s? And for me, I started it at 57. So at the at the same time, so... It's a really good question. I think I'm going to choose the finish line. All right, let's do it. Yeah. I, when you have a finish line and you say, let's say I'm going to be good. I'm going to have 20 cognizant years left, 20 years where my brain is good. It might be more than that, but let's just say it's 20 years. What that means is if I have 20 good years left in me from a mental capacity, unfortunately, my mother-in-law, who was a brilliant woman, had Alzheimer's and passed away three years ago. And we saw the decline. This woman was just so brilliant. And 
I don't want that to happen to me. And I don't want that to happen to anybody else in the family for obvious reasons. But it was really hard to watch that. Mm. The only thing that Colette didn't do that all of the gurus tell you to do is she suffered from terrible insomnia, terrible insomnia. And one of, and insomnia is linked to um, some cognitive decline in later years. And because I was having terrible insomnia due to night sweats, it was one of the reasons that I was really motivated to solve this problem for me. Well, yeah, that makes sense. That makes I, sense. I just, you know, I just thought I can't mess around with my sleep. Sleep is so important. And we're learning more and more about how important it is. So that was really the major issue that got me motivated to solve my night sweats problem. Yeah, then- but even thinking about the finish line, like you're right, because when you start a business in your 30s, you might not even be thinking about the finish line because of the age and stage, you're just going full tilt and building. But when you're starting later in life, you may think depending on your goals and the lifestyle that you want to create, and also what the other people in your family, maybe a partner, are doing. But you may think, oh, I have 10 years, I have 15 years, I have 20 years, I have five years even, you know, or I've got full-time years, and then I want to build it in a way that I can work part-time. There's those kinds of things come up. And that's why I was so glad that you called it out, because it's very subjective. There's no right or wrong answer. There's some things we can control. There's some things we can't control, but there's also what you want and not everybody wants the same thing. So it's really important to be in touch with what it is that you want. (laughs) So the other thing that you said is that you did suffer migraines for eight years. You said that in your notes, Mm -hmm. and that was something else that really affected you with, with some of the thoughts that you had about moving forward. Yeah, it was. So I do, fortunately, they are more or less under control. They're not 100% under control. I still get them. I'm, I'm learning how to manage them. But what usually happens is when I get one, it's in the middle of the night. It's a screaming migraine. I try to link it back to an activity or a trigger of some kind. Sometimes it's just God knows why I'm having one tonight. I have to make sure that I don't take on more than I can possibly handle. And my energy levels compared to my 30s and 40s they're definitely less. I don't have that same stamina. I don't like I'm up at 6.30 most days, but I am in bed by 9.30 or 10. And I know that sounds embarrassing. No, to me, like, but I, 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 can't I would it. say, I would say that talking about energy has come up in, in, I think a majority of the interviews I've done so far. So you're not alone, but the thing, the disconnect for so many people is that they have the energy difference, but they're not going to bed at 930 like you are. So we still struggle with it, you know, but so noticing that there's an energy difference is really important and deciding to help yourself to honor uh, what your body needs is a separate issue. Right. That's true. I'm not one of those people who can power through. Right. So I, I don't like to power through. I'm a bear the next day. It makes me worse off the next day. So I have to get my sleep or I can't, I can't function. So, so getting my sleep, but you know, knowing that there's a finish line means you make different decisions. Yeah. You make decisions about, okay, I'm not going to try and do all this myself. I am a, I'm going to learn from other people. I'm going to reach out and ask for help. I am willing to take on a partner if someone has an interest in coming in and helping, but that person has to have a different skill set than I have. Exactly. That kind of thing, right. I don't want someone who thinks the way I do. I want someone who maybe is a little more detached than I am because they, I'm very passionate about this project. I need someone who's not, I need someone who's more likely to take the whole, the cold, hard look at it. Right. So, more tactical perhaps. Exactly, or, or Exactly. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. You know, the other thing that you mentioned in your notes that really I wanted to ask you about was that doing this business, as much as you had been an entrepreneur in different parts of your life, that doing it is exceptionally meaningful for you because you created something that has actually come out of your head. Yeah. And I'm thinking back to those early uh, investigation and exploration you did into Amazon, and it just wasn't fitting for you. But this was an idea that came from every corner of your brain that had gifts and talents and experience of some sort. And it is such a perfect 
example of how things you're passionate about, there are clues everywhere. If you look at your history, there are clues everywhere why this is the obvious thing that you created. You can tell how excited you are about it. And I just love it that you notice that what you needed and that you're so proud of it, that it's so rewarding. That just, I think that's so good. And if you really look at the women that I'm interviewing, the women that we both know who are entrepreneurs, we're charged up. We are all fired up. We're excited about the way that we're contributing and the way that we can give back and and help the world or at least our small corner of it, right? Right. So I just love that you you really hit the nail on the head with that. And yeah, I wish you the best of luck in this business. It is super, super exciting what you're doing. So how what is the best place for people to get a hold of you or even purchase a nightgown? Oh, well, definitely they can visit our website, which is coolyoursweats.com. And uh, they can order it there. It's going to be available. It's We've been out of stock for several months now due to some supply chain issues. But I just got word from my factory that they are coming back in the very beginning of April. I'm so oh, excited. And and we've got, we've actually added a, a larger size because I'd only put two sizes in there at the beginning. I wanted to see what was going to happen with it. And then I had a lot of requests for a larger size. So I was like, yeah, of course I'll do a larger size. So yeah. Kathy, oh my gosh. Thank you so much for taking the time from your day and sharing all of this. I really appreciate how authentic and, you know, just how open you were about expressing the age-related challenges, but also the age-related benefits. Like I said, the pride that you experience from creating this right out of your head. <laughs> I totally love what you're doing. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Susie. I really do appreciate it. I love your story. So, all right, this is all, that's all I have for you right now. If you're listening and loving what you hear, please like and subscribe. Reviews are great too and much appreciated. And if you're a woman in the middle who's 50 or over and an entrepreneur and would like to also come on the show, please go to www.midlifeinterviews.com and fill out an application. I would love to have you on to share your story. Thanks so much for listening. It is never too late for you to put yourself on your agenda. I'm Susie Rosenstein and I'll talk to you again soon. Now, real quick before we say goodbye, if you are connecting with the show, I'd love to invite you to a happiness breakthrough coaching session. It's my laser focused coaching call that will help you get clear about what's getting in your way as a woman in the middle entrepreneur and confident about your next steps to more happiness in your next chapter. Head over to www.nextchapterbreakthrough.com. Talk to you soon. Oh, 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 oh,